for the introduction, Ruth, and uh, a big thank you to Wild Oceans for inviting me to speak today. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm a master's student at the University of Cape Town, and I study manta rays, as Ruth said. But though I am currently specialized in manta rays, I'm very excited to talk about all rays in general. Um, because like sharks, they're all important. They all need our help. And they're just amazing animals. One could even say that they're radical. <laughs> okay, so um, rays belong to the same mega group as sharks called chondrichthians. And they evolved away from sharks around 200 million years ago. They became our dorsal ventrally compressed sharks, which means flattened from the top. So it's if someone took a shark and a rolling pin and rolled out a nice, beautiful ray. So we also like to call them our flat sharks, our flappy sharks, our shark pancakes, our majestic flat flaps. And they originally evolved for a benthic life, which means on the bottom, so a life on the seafloor. But some species did adapt for a pelagic life or an open ocean life. And uh, there's over 600 species in the world with over 70 in South Africa. So we really are a hotspot for sharks and rays. And the rays are often overlooked, yet they are actually in a worse conservation status than sharks. They include the most critically endangered group of fish. And um, they don't get such a bad name as sharks, but they do get a little bit of a bad name due to the accident with Steve Irwin. Um, but they're actually, all of them are the most fascinating, wonderful, gentle creatures, and I'll share some, some really nice encounters with you today. So in Sandeli's and Lauren's talks, we learned that sharks have no bones. They're made, uh, and rays, um, they're made from cartilage, so the same material as your nose and ears. And also like sharks, uh, rays have a sixth and a seventh sense. So the first being uh, lateral lines, which detect water displacement, uh, which the bony fish have too. Uh, they also have dermal denticles, so dermal meaning skin and denticles meaning teeth. It's, uh, it's actually skin teeth on their skin. It helps um, them move faster in the water and uh, helps prevent parasites from grabbing onto them. Feels like sandpaper, just like sharks. And then their seventh sense um, actually detects electric fields. So this is the, the ampullae of Lorenzini. So they can feel animals' heartbeat when they're nearby. So as I said, rays originally evolved for a life on the seafloor. So most of them eat you know, your, bottom, your bottom animals, like mussels and clams, snails, crabs, uh, crayfish, other fish. And, um, but Unlike us, they actually use their other senses, like those lateral lines and those ampullae of Lorenzini to find those fish. Their jaws are so powerful that they can crush those shells, those clam shells and those mussel shells. And then, yeah, the majority do feed on the seafloor, but here on the right is a manta ray. They are filter feeders, so we'll talk more about that later. But what they do is they, they bring in water into their gills and trap the plankton, uh, which is a little tiny marine animal that can't move against the current. They trap that plankton in their gills and eat it that way. They actually don't chew or uh, bite their food. So they filter feed kind of like a whale, a humpback whale or a whale shark do. So like the sharks, rays have a huge diversity of reproduction. So on the top left here, it's called a mermaid's purse. Um, I'm sure those of you from South Africa, um, you might have seen these while wa walking on the beach. This is a skate egg case. So inside there's an egg and the baby feeds on the yolk in, the, in there until it hatches. And actually, if you find these on the beach, you're able to report them to a monitoring group called ELMO. And then other rays have live birth. Uh, and th this is by two ways. So one is um, the, the babies are inside the egg, inside the mother, and they actually survive on the yolk in there. And then they hatch inside the mother and swim out. So look at these cute little sawfish here. And also um, stingrays do that. 
And then there's some rays that have live birth as well, but they get their nutrients a different way. So these manta rays, they only have one baby um, which grows inside them for a year. And the baby um, feeds on this, this fat rich substance that the mother provides. Uh, so I love mantas, but I, I don't want to come back as a, a mother manta because the baby will be born half the size. Um, and another thing I want, to take, I want you to take away from ray reproduction is that like sharks, um, they're very slow to reproduce. They have small litter sizes, um, slow maturation, and, and so any type of fishing on these guys is just not sustainable. All right, so these are the ray groups that we're going to cover today. We're not going to cover all of the rays, but um, I've highlighted some really cool groups. So we've got the sawfishes, wedge fishes, and guitar fishes. Then we'll talk about the electric rays. Then we'll talk about skates. And then we'll talk about stingrays, butterfly rays, eagle rays, and mobulid rays. All right, so sawfishes. Among the largest rays, these guys can reach up to seven meters total length. And they're characterized by the snout. Uh, covered in large denticles. So remember that word denticle. So these large teeth. And I mean, look at them. They're so cool. They look like gladiators of the sea. They've just got this like huge saw on them. And this snout is actually covered in those electric senses, the ampullae of Lorenzini. So they can detect fish and their prey under the sand and then use their saw to capture them. Unfortunately, these animals are highly endangered. So uh, they were once worldwide in tropical locations, um, but most places they have gone regionally extinct. Um, these three species I've listed are the ones that we used to be able to find in South Africa. Um, so these guys, they spend a lot of time in estuaries and rivers, and in those places people use a lot of these gill nets. And unfortunately the sawfish uh, were getting caught in the gill nets too much and they just can't uh, reproduce fast enough um, to be caught. But there are some places you can still see them. Uh, for instance, Florida, you can still see the small tooth sawfish there. And then wedge fishes, these are one of my favorite groups. They have a triangular uh, fin that joins behind their eye, giving them a shark-like or a wedge-like look. And out of five species in Africa, we do have two here in South Africa. So, that would be the white spotted wedge fish and the shark ray. Uh, these guys were recently named the world's most endangered fish. Uh, they are highly prized in Asian markets for shark fin soup. Um, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share a quick video of one species, the shark ray, who I wanna highlight. Um, these guys are widespread in the, in the West Indian Pacific Oceans. And this is a video I took from Zavra Mozambique where I was based for the last year and a half for my masters. Um, so check out how cool these guys are. You can see these in South Africa too. You can see these guys in Sadwana or Aliwal Shoal. And uh, look at those amazing ridges of large thorns on the back and between the eyes and that beautiful spot pattern you can identify individually. Um, these guys feed on mud flats and they sometimes use cleaning stations, places on reef um, where they can get uh, their wounds cleaned or parasites removed by uh, cleaner fish. Um, so sometimes us divers go and dive on these cleaning stations. Sometimes we're lucky to see them. Okay, so the rhino rays or the wedge fishes need your help. How lucky are we in South Africa to have both rhinos on the land and in the sea? But like our rhinos on land, these guys are quickly facing extinction for poaching, mainly for shark fin soup. So uh, their fins are actually the most expensive and um, highly prized fin of all the shark fin trade, sometimes up to $1,000 per kilogram. Um, but again, these guys have slow reproduction. They just can't reproduce fast enough for the level of fishing that's going on. And there's actually almost no protection globally for these species. There's only about eight countries in the world that have some level of protection. So how can you help? You can spread the word, talk about how cool these guys are, tell your friends, your family, social media, get in the water to see them and see how cool they are, go diving or snorkeling. And you can write a song or a story or draw pictures. Um, any way you can get the word out for these rhino rays will be super beneficial. 
All right, so guitar fishes. These guys are the smaller sisters to the wedge fishes. Their snout is longer and ranges between the species. Uh, these guys are often found hiding in the sand and you can just see their eyes poking out. They're very cute. <laughs> Um, there's quite a diversity of them, and we are lucky here in South Africa to have at least five species. Uh, that middle one there, the blunt-nosed guitar fish, it's got the rounded snout. Um, this species is endemic to Namibia, from Namibia to the Western Cape. And endemic means they're found nowhere else in the world. So that's really cool that we have these guys here. All right, electric rays. There are at least three species in South Africa, and these guys, they can give an electric shock up to 220 volts. It's like their superpower. Um, and they use that to, as defense from predators and to stun their prey. So you can see outlined in blue, it might not be um, easy to see, but outlined in that blue square, uh, you can see the little googly eyes in front of the spiracles. So the spiracles, are organs that pump the water through their gills so that they can breathe. And so their electric organs are on the top or the dorsal surface. So when they go to stun their prey, they actually have to wrap around and stun them that way. So we're gonna talk quickly about the marbled torpedo ray. This is a torpedo ray found um, quite commonly in South African and Mozambique waters. And I bet you think an animal that can deliver an electric shock is pretty scary. Well, not always. I'm gonna share a quick video and story with you about um, when I was snorkeling in this rock pool in, Mo in Zavra, Mozambique. It's only about two meters deep and we were looking for nudibranchs on the reef when all of a sudden this torpedo ray came and swam on my arm and then she proceeded to actually almost play or swim with myself and two friends for more than half an hour. And she always initiated the encounters. None of us swam after her. She kept swimming on our arms, on our hands. She swam on my friend's head. Now, I would never recommend going up to these guys because their shock can kill you. But it just shows you how um, wonderful and gentle these animals can be if you let them come to you. So I hope you can see this video. It's just a quick clip of, of her coming right up and saying hello. See her spiracles um, pumping the water there. Oh, yeah, super cool. All right, so skates. This group of, of rays are often underappreciated, but they're really important. They are, and really cool. Um, they are the most diverse ray group. There's more than 220 species in the world and at least 25 in South Africa. Now these guys, they generally live in deeper waters from about 200 meters to 1,350 meters, but some live near shore too, and they are worldwide in tropical, so warm and polar cold seas. They're often confused with stingrays, but they are different. So here's how to tell them apart. You can look at first their snout. They have a more pointed snout, and the stingrays have a more round snout. And then you look at the pelvic fins. So those are the fins um, near the back of the ray. The skate will have two notches or two lobes and the stingray will just have one. And then another thing you can look at is their tail. Skates don't have a stinger, but stingrays do. So there's a lot of really cool skate species. Uh, last week, Lauren's talk, um, she mentioned the, the Pacific white skate, which was amazing. Those guys lay their eggs at uh, hydrothermal vents, which are deep sea, like underwater volcanoes, and that just blew my mind. Um, there's also the big thorn skate with the, with the big thorns down the back. They kind of look like dragons. And then the black spot skate. This is another endemic species to South Africa or found nowhere else in the world. Um, and then I want to mention one more thing. Uh, skates are often taken in fisheries around the world for human consumption. Um, but thankfully in South Africa, this is not very prevalent. So that's actually really good for their conservation. Okay, so family Dasyatidae, stingrays. These guys are our true stingrays. There are other families of stingrays uh, like freshwater stingrays and six gills, but we're gonna focus on these guys today. 
So they are, um, as you see in this picture, they're brightly colored, they're charismatic, and they generally live in the shallow waters. And we have about 14 species in South Africa. These guys are harmless except for the tail spine, but this itself is not necessarily deadly. So they have these serrated barbs, you can see, um, and they're in reverse. So that, that means actually when the stinger goes into someone, when you pull it out, it does more damage that way. Um, but these guys don't attack people. Um, the main danger is actually when you're walking from the beach and you're walking into the ocean to swim, um, you might accidentally step on one because they like to hang out in the shallow water, in the sand. So you can do the, the stingray shuffle, um, which is, actually works and is pretty fun to do. Uh, if you don't know what that is, maybe look it up on YouTube later, but you shuffle your feet in the sand and it actually scares the, the rays away. And um, ancient Greeks actually used to use their venom as, an, as a pain relief. So you know that the venom isn't necessarily deadly. It's only if it hits you uh, in a really sensitive spot. So, I mean, the accident with Steve Irwin was horrible, um, but he, he did grab the stingray and it, it stung him in a, in a bad spot. So um, that was just a horrible accident. They're actually uh, amazing animals and they're super gentle and curious and, and awesome. So I'm going to show you another video <laughs> of, uh, from Zavra again, um, Mozambique. Um, where I noticed the stingray from about 30 meters away and I thought, let me just hang out here and, and see what happens. And you can see the top right corner, um, a, another diver, my friend Marta, took the, the picture of us. Um, but you can see the stingray is just super curious. I mean, she just came right up and said hello. And I mean, I, I wasn't nervous and I knew she wouldn't do anything to me. So you can see she actually swims right on top of my arm and uh, then goes on her way. So you can see they're really not um, dangerous. Again, just uh, don't approach the animal yourself. See if you're maybe lucky that they come to you. Um, so here are some cool species found here in South Africa. So on the top left, or on the top, we have the blue spotted mask ray and the round ribbon tail ray and also the honeycomb whip ray. These are uh, ray species you can see while diving in Protea banks or Aliwal Shoal or uh, up in Sadwana. Um, these guys are quite widespread. Um, and then the bottom right is the gargantuan short tail stingray. Uh, so this picture is from Struaspai Harbor. I really like the story of this guy. His name is Perry. And he was released from the Two Oceans Aquarium and apparently he just loves human company that he just comes right up to people and says hi. And I mean, these guys get really big, so it must be really cool. Um, they get up to four meters and they can weigh as heavy as 350 kilos. So <laughs> quite huge, um, awesome animals. Okay, so the butterfly rays, this entire group of rays is very mysterious. And there's not much known about them. Um, we do have one species here in the picture here in South Africa, uh, Gymnura natalensis. This species is endemic to South Africa, so found nowhere else in the world. Um, one of my friends actually in Aliwal, uh, saw one on Aliwal Shoal, which is super lucky, I'm super jealous. <laughs> um, and then they found individuals in Naisna that have weighed up to 82 kilograms, so they can get pretty big. All right, and then our eagle rays. So these are our true pelagic open ocean rays that fly and glide through the sea. There's at least five species in South Africa, including this spotted eagle ray on the left. Uh, this guy um, is actually a juvenile. You can see how long that tail is compared to his, um, her or his little body. And they actually, their body grows bigger, but their tail remains the same. So when this ray grows up, it, it'll look uh, more proportional for right now. It looks pretty awkward, but very cute. Uh, and then the common eagle ray at the top is another um, amazing species found uh, commonly in South Africa. And sometimes these rays come together in massive groups, uh, like the Kaunos rays in the Atlantic Ocean. They group together like thousands and thousands um, traveling. Maybe you've seen pictures like that online.
Um, and even though they swim in the open ocean, they still like to feed on the seafloor. So they still eat crabs and fish and clams, mussels, uh, lobsters. And so they have these uh, special structures on their faces uh, that help them feed on the seafloor. So these are called cephalic lobes or cephalic fins. And you can see with each um, species that it, it varies quite a bit. So on the top left and, and the bottom left, um, so it's the bull ray and the spotted eagle ray, they've got kind of like a, like a one nose kind of thing. Um, that top left, the bull ray, you can actually find those guys off Durban, which I would really like to see them. Uh, and then you have the top right, the cow nose ray with the two bumps. Um, so they vary quite a bit. And these lobes actually um, are filled with those ampullae of Lorenzini or those um, electric senses. So we're going to uh, focus on the right three. On the left three are, the, um, are some stingrays and skates. They also have the electric senses um, on their faces. Um, so you can see these cephalic lobes help these, uh, these uh, open ocean rays still feed on the seafloor. But notice the bottom one, M. japonica, that's a mobulid, um, that's a mant uh, devil ray, one of those plankton eating rays. These guys don't have any of the electric senses on them, um, but they still use them to feed and push the plankton into their mouth. Um, so one of the cool research projects we worked on this year was to maybe see what um, manta rays are using their cephalic fins for, because manta rays seem to use them in a, in a lot of different ways, but we'll talk more about that now, just now. Okay, so last but not least are filter feeding rays. Um, so this means that they don't bite or chew their food. The food goes into their gills, the water passes through their gill slits, and the plankton gets trapped inside those gill rakers. Um, so a quick review on plankton again, any small animal that can't move against the current. So on the top here is a single-celled uh, plankton, so it's just a tiny, tiny, tiny animal. Um, the middle one is like a fish egg, so there's tons and tons of different fish eggs floating out there in the water that these guys can eat. The bottom one is a marine snail, um, also known as a, a sea butterfly, um, so lots of different, different plankton they can eat. Um, there's currently seven species of devil rays and two species of manta rays, but we know so little about these guys that scientists are often arguing which species are which species and, and uh, yeah, uh, which genus, and um, uh, some people are still describing species of, of manta rays. All right, so these guys also do migrate in huge numbers. So this is a monk's devil ray, Mobula munchiana. These occur off the Pacific coast of Mexico. Um, but I've heard from divers and, and researchers here in South Africa that they see uh, Mobula culiae, the short fin devil ray, to do this. So hopefully we'll see that sometime, or I will, <laughs> that we all will sometime. Okay, um, so though our eagle, devil, and manta rays are shallow water living, they have been found to dive to extraordinary depths. So we're going to play a quick game here. Now I want to think in your head, ha guess, how deep you think the reef manta ray can go? If you guess over 600 meters, well done. Okay, who wants to guess or think of another number, how deep the giant devil ray, mobular mobular goes? 700 meters. How about the common eagle ray, the species we saw on the eagle ray slide? 800 meters. We've got two more to go. Who can guess how deep the giant manta ray is known to dive? 1400 meters. And now who wants to guess what is currently known as the deepest diving uh, mobulid ray, the sickle fin devil ray? 2000 meters. That's 6600 feet. Still blows my mind. <laughs> okay, so manta rays, my personal favorite. They are the largest rays in the world. 
the bigger species gets up to eight meters. So this is a picture of Dr. Andrea Marshall. She's also known as the, the queen of mantas. Look how tiny she is compared to this manta. They just get massive. So mantas are actually the most recently evolved ray, which means that over time they've come, become quite uh, advanced, if you will. Uh, for example, they have the largest brain to body size ratio of all fish. So scientists use um, brain to body size ratio to kind of gauge a uh, level of intelligence. Um, so for example, humans have the largest brain to body size ratio of all animals. Um, other large ones would be uh, dolphins. Okay, so for fish, um, it's the manta rays. Um, and this, this intelligence is quite evident in many behaviors. So, um, for example, uh, one is called cyclone feeding. So they are smart enough to know that their plankton can be quite scattered. Um, the little animals that they eat can be quite scattered. But they're smart enough to know if they work together and they swim in a, in a circle, in a big, um, like make a big whirlpool, Kind of like if you have a pool in your yard and you like to run around the pool and then everything goes to the middle that's what these guys do they work together to bring the plankton into the middle and then they just feast on it so that's just one example of how smart they are unfortunately though manta and devil rays are under threat uh, many are listed on the on the iucn many are are endangered and that's due to um, the gill raker trade. So these are gill rakers. These are the organs that trap the plankton when the, the, the manta and double rays are feeding. Um, and unfortunately, it's, they are targeted uh, for, for these gill rakers for a traditional medicine um, trade. So the logic is that these gill rakers because they filter feed in the ocean that if someone eats those in a, in a tonic that it will filter toxins out of your body but it's actually harmful for you to eat this because there's there's levels of heavy metal in them like arsenic and cadmium um, but unfortunately uh, you know they've convinced people that they they want to have this and it's actually a really um, it's probably the biggest factor to the decline of devil and manta rays around the world. So like the case of the rhino horn, uh, ri um, the rhino horn trade, you know, completely unnecessary, but unfortunately um, quite a big trade. But on the bright side, um, what researchers and conservationists around the world are showing and divers and dive operations that uh, manta rays are worth a lot more alive than dead. So divers and snorkel snorkelers travel around the world to see manta rays. Uh, in Mozambique, there was a study by Dr. Stephanie Van Abels who found that just in this small province in Mozambique that um, the manta rays bring in at least $11 million uh, every year. So just because there's manta rays in the water, this small province gets that much. And then even more um, through other tourism like you know, being in the hotels or the restaurants. I mean, they have a huge economic impact. So we really need to protect them because communities can benefit from them. Um, and yeah, if, it, if you're looking solely from an economic perspective, um, you know, they're worth it to protect them. Uh, so Lauren mentioned last week, um, one of the cool things that manta rays do, uh, they have these mating trains which means that um, when the male and the female manta may mate, uh, there's a lead female and from two males up to like 40 males or maybe even more will be following her and they'll be copying her every move and trying to convince her to mate with them. You know, maybe she'll do like a, this ac acrobatic swim and then the others will follow. And this mating train can last from 20 minutes up to 48 hours, one study found. It depends on how picky the female is. Um, but here's just a quick video I took um, when I just turned around once and had this, this train of mantas coming towards me. Um, so notice their bellies. Those spot patterns 
are all different for each manta. And then notice the last one, that's a melanistic manta or a black morph manta. Um, so mantas are so cool, they have ninja versions. Uh, but talking about that spot pattern, um, around the world, this is how people uh, mark and, and study their manta rays. So they can take a picture of the bottom and because it's unique and permanent to every individual, they can track that individual over time. Um, so there's uh, this online public database called Manta Matcher, and people around the world submit their Manta photos. So the really cool thing about this way to monitor Mantas is that you don't have to be a scientist to take a photo. So these databases are almost entirely um, citizen-based. Um, so I'm actually going to ask for all of your help today. Um, no matter where you are in the world, if you see mantas and you do happen to get a photo of their belly, to upload it onto Manta Matcher because it really helps us keep track of these guys, especially in South Africa. So I'm trying to investigate more the, the manta rays of South Africa. So if you have some manta photos and you haven't yet um, uploaded them, please do. It would, it would help so much to kind of understand what's going on with the with the mantas we see in South Africa and this is kind of like a Facebook for mantas so you can get on and search any location any individual and when you upload your individual you can know how many times it's been seen or if it's never been seen if it has a name or maybe you can name it so it's a lot of fun um, and I just want to end with um, just ways that we can help raise no matter where you are in the world. So just some simple ways um, you can help them from home. Um, so the first would be sustainable seafood choices. Um, so I would say always buy directly from, from your fisherman and knowing that he used hook and line or spearfishing because a lot of these uh, fishing methods like um, long lines, which, which catch so many sharks and rays, maybe even dolphins sometimes, trawling, gill nets. You don't know where your, um, where your seafood comes from when you purchase it in, in the supermarket. Um, but you can use this SASI application. So if you don't have the luxury to buy it directly from someone, which most of us don't, um, you can use this SASI application or other applications um, on your phone to see which is sustainable. Um, another thing you can do, um, get out diving and go see these rays. Um, go out snorkeling or free diving or scuba diving and, and, and see how awesome these animals are. Um, and post your media when you see these guys. Um, some other things you can do are just uh, using sustainable products. So um, for instance, using sunscreen that, that has the active ingredient zinc because a lot of these sunscreens are actually really harmful for the ocean and for you. Um, in your home and beauty products, go ahead and check the back of things and make sure that there's no uh, squalene in there because squalene comes from sharks and rays. So it actually fuels this industry that is taking sharks and rays. Um, some other things you can do, yeah, spread the word, cool facts, stories to your friends, to your family, to as many people as you can. Um, and then just reducing our waste. Um, so the most easy way to do this is, um, you know, reducing your single-use plastics. Uh, bring your own shopping bags to, um, to the store. Buy your fruit and vegetables that are not wrapped in plastic. Um, there's these really cool... Uh, wax paper wraps that you can use now uh, instead of Ziploc bags and saran wrap. Um, they're reusable. Um, they're really cool. And um, yeah, check out the Wild Oceans Shark Attack website um, for updates and more information. Um, for kids activities, um, the Take Action page outlines a lot of uh, important and awesome things you can do. And um, yeah, these are just some suggestions. And it, the idea is just so that when you, when you are able to do some of these things, you can feel good and know that you are helping raise an ocean. Um, so yeah, that's it. I just wanted to say uh, thank you from the bottom of the ocean to Wild Oceans for letting me speak today. Um, thank you to my supervisors and, and these supporters here that have supported me. Um, in Mozambique and South Africa. And uh, yeah, when all this lockdown is over, uh, come diving with us, come explore our rays and sharks and um, 
yeah, thanks to all of you for being here today.